I'm Duncan, and um, I was asked uh, a few weeks ago to come uh, talk and tell some stories, and uh, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, recently, a few, a few months ago, uh, I um, had cause to kind of take a step back from what I was doing and, and think a little bit about more about the whys of the things that I do rather than the hows and the whats. Um, and it was really interesting because I hadn't really done that before. I'd always, like maybe it's a typical male thing to do, but I'd always been quite blinkered and, and kind of um, doing this and focusing on this and, and not really thinking widely about what I'd learned so far and the things that I'd picked up along the way. Um, and when I actually sat down and thought about it and thought about, well, what is it that I really like to do and, and, and in what way, and sort of doing the right thing in the right way, I came up with a, with a bunch of stuff that had been kind of sitting in the back of my head for a while, um, and, and I wrote it down, and I thought, wow, that, that's, quite, uh, uh, that's quite mature, that's quite grown up, isn't it? And, uh, and I, I, had a, I, I gave a talk to, um, to a summer school course, uh, which was sort of along, it was like a prototype of this thing, and this is also still a prototype, so you'll have to forgive me if it's a bit of a ramble, but uh, maybe there's something in there which will a little bit. So um, I was trained as an industrial designer. I studied in uh, a school in a very industrial city in Britain. Uh, it's a town called Sheffield, which is famous for football violence and um, uh, a film about strippers. And um, that's about it, really. Um, and I was taught in a very traditional way by very traditional sorts of people. Um, and, uh, and I learned, or I, I, I kind of had banged into my head that in, the design was about adding value, and uh, a particularly financial value. And a lot of the briefs that we were given as students was like, take this toaster and make it cost more in the shop. Um, and that's a lot about what British design tends to be. It's like styling stuff, making it more expensive, making it more kind of uh, appeal to the next step on the class ladder up, and, and it's about aspiration. Um, and at, at some point during my studies, I had a chance to be an exchange student, and uh, there were three places we could go. Uh, one was in France, the other was in Atlanta, and I couldn't afford that, and the third one was in Lapland. And, um, and so a friend of mine and I decided that probably we should go to Lapland because um, we just liked the way the name sounded. Um, <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, my friend had a, a, an ambition to visit the three strangest named places in the world, which according to him, uh, late one night, was uh, Lapland, Hong Kong, and Timbuktu. Uh, so now he's managed to visit two of those places, and uh, as far as I know, he doesn't have any plans to go to Africa anytime soon, but let's see. Um, so. We went to Lapland and, and got a uh, to, to Lapinia Ripisto and got a very different sort of perspective on what uh, on what design's really about in terms of uh, solving real people's problems and uh, uh, kind of got immersed in the whole Nordic school of participatory design and universal design and design for accessibility and all this kind of stuff. But it was really nice because uh, it, it just gave a, a, a bigger perspective. And I think that was the thing that made me really decide that I wanted to study more. So I came to Tyke and um, studied here. I did an MA in industrial design. But at some point, it became painfully clear that uh, I was a really bad drawer. Uh, I, everyone else was drawing beautiful cars and shiny phones and all that sort of, sort of stuff that industrial designers do. And I was drawing boxes and arrows. And so I became an interaction designer. Um, and uh, I started working. Um, I set up an agency with a friend from Type. And um, we did some projects for Nokia as students and then later as, as consultants. And then we got some more clients, but mainly we were working for Nokia. And that was really interesting. That was a very, um, a very unique kind of perspective on that particular corporation, that particular culture uh, and way of doing things. And for, for me, it was also a, a really great way to, to learn maybe some of the more concrete realities of doing honest work for 
honest money kind of thing. Um, and in each of the jobs that I've done, including that one and since then, I've learned something. I've learned something about design, I've learned something about the world, and I've le learned something about myself. And I try to take that learning and, and, and use it in the next job after that. I think, I think it's a clinical symptom of insanity if you uh, repeat the same thing twice but expect it to do something differently. But um, I learned from that experience that uh, doing agency work for companies um, is interesting if you like constant change, if you like variety and so on, but if you really want to own something, if you want to see something through from the beginning to the end and feel that it's like your baby and, and you kind of freak out when people drive your stuff into a wall, it, it's kind of painful. So I decided to join a, a startup company and I got a fantastic opportunity to join Skype, uh, which was then uh, based in, in Tallinn and in London and uh, I joined as a designer there um, and worked there for four years and saw through from I think version 1.2 was in beta when I joined and I left after version 4 which was very very different and there'll be some conversation about that in a minute. Um, by that time I was living in London I was uh, the head of product design which was a group of about 20 designers doing all the kind of the main client interfaces so we didn't do marketing we didn't really do much uh, in, in, uh, with Skype.com, but the, the Windows client, the Mac client, the mobile stuff, the embedded Wi-Fi phones, and all the groovy stuff that Skype was doing, payments and things like that, was what I was responsible for. And that was uh, fantastic. I mean, it was an awesome experience, and, and I learned a lot about what works, what, what doesn't work, and, and also how companies grow. Because when I joined, I think I was uh, employee number 60 or 61 or something. When I left, there was something in the ballpark of 650 people. So big change. Also it was then owned by a big corporation and part of a family with other companies that had needs. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then I joined Nokia because um, <clears throat> I was kind of interested in what it would be like to work for the company that I consulted to. I, I was always curious what it was like on the inside. And at that point Nokia was clearly in some crisis. and uh, But they had they had some kind of an idea of, of what to do and they were starting to build some services and so on. I thought, yeah, that would be great, so I'll do that. And I did that. Um, and that was interesting. I learned also a great deal. Uh, the main piece of work that I did was uh, Nokia's N9, which came out, uh, I guess, two, three months ago. It was released, this uh, swipe interface and, um, and so on, which was built on top of Migo, which, as you probably all know, got killed. Uh, which brings me back to that moment where I was sitting down and thinking, okay, what have I learned? And uh, what should I do about that stuff? So, um, I think, looking back, it took me a while to figure out what school is for and why, like, what you're supposed to get out of, of school and university. But um, it turned out that the, the value is not so much in the content, in the projects and the courses and yeah, there's value there, and there's a special value in the people you meet and the, the friendships that you make and so on. But really what school is for is teaching you how to learn so that you can then teach yourself every day and, and uh, as, you, as you go through these uh, work experiences so that you, you sort of learn the tools for processing the stuff that goes on. So what I've done is I've collected together some of the principles and some of the rules of thumb that I've picked up along the way and which have helped me quite a lot. A lot of these things I figured out by seeing people doing the exact opposite of them, um, which is also quite interesting. You learn a lot about what not to do when you work, just as much as you learn what to do. So these are the eight things that I'm gonna talk about. So we'll start off with the one which I think is the most important, and this one is, it's very, um, <clears throat> very dear to my heart because basically as a designer, this is the single most important thing. Nothing is more important than finding the right problem to solve. Because if you're not solving the right problem, you're basically making beautiful landfill. It's trash and it will go in the bin. So 
I don't know, probably most of you have seen this and, and, uh, and are totally familiar with it, but I show it because it, it's really useful to explain what design is to me and this whole finding the right problem to solve. So uh, design gets kind of mangled as a term. People tend to like force it into whatever box they, that suits them at any time. Um, and uh, so there are all kinds of stereotypes and, and, uh, uh, and all kinds of specialization of graphic design, interaction design, usability, uh, information architecture, and, and the list just goes on and on and on. But really, design is about problem solving. And if you're solving problems, then you're designing. It's about planning, and it's about problem solving. And this thing shows it really nicely, because what happens a lot is even in this enlightened day and age where everyone's grasped the value of, of being customer-centric and, and good design has been that's value added and so on, and everyone sort of looks at Apple and bows down and worships, they still really only get this bit. And they think, well, okay, it's, it's like, it's making it look pretty, right? It's about graphics and assets and so on. But this first half is about figuring out what the right thing to design is. The second half is about then designing it in the right way. So design as planning, design as problem solving, is really explained by this, focusing on this side of things, where you question the brief. You tear up all those assumptions about what might be the right thing to do. There's a really nice example from a guy called Victor Papanek, who maybe some of you have heard of, or maybe he's sort of sunk without trace, but uh, basically he was a, a, like a bearded hippie in the 60s and 70s, and he was a big proponent of participatory design and, um, and full life cycle design and, and so on, taught a lot in the States. But he tells a really nice story, which I use to death, because it really illustrates the point well, which is about a company that came to him and asked him and a group of his students to design a gadget that would clip to the edge, and this is the brief, right? So they came and said, right, we need you to make a battery-powered thing that clips to the edge of a coffee or teacup and will beep when a blind person has filled the coffee or teacup to the right level. So they don't, it doesn't spill or overflow and burn them. And, um, and so the students went, right, okay. Um, oh, and I think the brief was also, like, it's got to cost less than $10 and blah, blah, blah. So they went off and thought about this for a while, and they probably even prototyped a few things, and you can imagine them hanging stuff off the side of cups. But then they noticed that when you fill a glass or a cup with a liquid, it makes a sound. There is an acoustic response, because usually the edges, the, the sides of the vessel are pitched. And so you notice it, it makes this rising sound when you put the water in. And they thought, oh, that's good. And so, um, they figured out that blind people have all these tricks and, and through observation or whatever, they realize that people either stick their thumb in, just so, um, which is uh, a bit uh, risky if it's hot liquid and also it's kind of gross if they're pouring you a glass of wine, but uh, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a solution. But they also realized that they were listening to the sound and they got familiar with, the, with their own uh, tableware. So, what they didn't do was design a battery-powered object that hung off the side of the, the cup. Because they realized the problem wasn't about it overflowing, it was about um, understanding uh, like where in the cup the, the liquid was. Um, so what they did was they made a leaflet, a piece of paper printed in braille with a list of good uh, tableware, or tableware with good acoustics, and where you could buy them from. And that was it. That was the product. There wasn't a battery powered thing or two. It was a list of glasses that make a good, clear, rising sound in braille. So they figured out the right problem to solve and then solved it in a nice way. This thing, which some of you who follow cynical blogs on the internet may have noticed recently, is wrong for a number of reasons. Uh, apart from the fact that, well, okay. So you can look at this thing, and obviously don't look at it too long because your eyes will burn and you may be a little sick in your mouth like I was when I first saw it, but it, is, it sort of divides people into, it makes people think of a couple of things. Immediately, spontaneously, most designers will look at this and go, holy shit, 
what on earth is going on at the top there? What is all this stuff? It looks like a nightmare. There's just too much stuff, too much clutter, blah, 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 blah. And you can probably list out 10 uh, design reasons why this is bad. But then you're missing the point. The point is, and what the real problem is, is this thing shouldn't exist at all. It's not solving the right problem. The right problem is people don't think in terms of files so much anymore. Are files really important? Are folders really important? Are zipping, compressing, and sending? Are those things being done in the same way now and for the next five years as they were since 1986 or whenever the first version of Windows Explorer came out? No, because devices like, do you have files on devices like this? Do you have files on your iPad? No. This is solving the wrong problem. Another, another example, and this comes from a blog which you have a certain sense of humor, it's kind of hilarious, which is called uh, Things People Don't Say About Advertising.com. So when you're bored, you can check it out. But a lot of companies sometimes mistake or get confused, and they, they, uh, they try to solve their own problems, and they forget that those are not the same problems that normal people have. So don't get distracted by uh, corporate agendas, which are not necessarily rooted in real, in real, real problems. So moving on to the second thing, which sort of flows nicely from the first thing, is once you've figured out what the right problem to solve is, you then have to figure out what's important and what's not. And you will find it incredibly hard to know what is important and what's not if you don't know what problem you're solving. So one tool which is really useful is something called the high concept pitch, and this was stolen from, from Hollywood. So the high concept pitch is like a one sentence thing uh, which describes what you're trying to do, what you're trying to make. So the example uh, that I was given was uh, Die Hard on a Bus, which is a high concept pitch for a movie which most of you know. I don't know if anyone can guess what that is. There you go. So, Die Hard on a Bus was the high concept pitch for speed. And you say that to someone, and they know exactly the move that you're making. That generally means that it's uh, not of the highest artistic value, if you can explain it in that way. But still, I think it grossed uh, pretty well and made people money, so it's fine. It entertained people for a bit. So the high concept pitch is super important. and, and um, Knowing or being able to tell what's important and what's not important is, is uh, it's key to that. Um, my colleagues and everyone that I've worked with for the last, I guess, five, six years now teases me and makes fun of me because I start almost every single meeting and conversation that I ever have with what problem are we solving? What is the problem that we're solving? Because it just you know focuses people's minds uh, down on, on what it is that is important and what's not. And this second thing is, is critical, right? Because if you try to do too much, you have two problems. One, you may not do any of it very well. And secondly, people don't really know what you do, what it is, what is this thing. It's very hard for an object to scream its identity, its purpose, its story, if it's all about all kinds of different things. This thing, does something very well. It's an excellent gift. But as a knife, it's shit. <laughs> that does one thing, and it's wicked at it. In fact, sometimes it's a little too good at it, and you lose the end of your finger. Again, does one thing, everyone knows what it is, not much mistaking that. This thing, which is a piece of, uh, of um, work from my life, uh, wasn't very good at deciding what was important and what was not. So we tried to shoehorn like a hundred features into an interface. And with every release there was another 20 or another 30 or another 40, more and more features, and you just try and kind of shoehorn them in. <coughs> and, and you can do that if you say, all right, that feature, that, that one thing, that's the most important thing. And then you hide everything else under a menu, or, you, or, or even better, you just don't do it at all. You drop it because there's this law of diminishing returns, right? So there's a bunch of principles that you'll no doubt have forced down your throat at some point, things like Pareto's law, 80-20, uh, 
that you know you get like uh, eighty percent of returns from twenty percent of investment and, and all kinds of stuff. That's very useful by the way, only to a eighty twenty rule. But what what we didn't do here was figure out like what was the most important thing. We said everything is equally important and that's it. And it looks like someone kind of vomited on the screen and it's just <laughs> all there. You can't really as a user you can't look at that and go, okay, first I need to go there and click that and then I need to do this. There's not a clear flow, there's just a lot of shit up there. Um, so knowing what's important and what's not is very, very important in making anything good. Uh, some clever person uh, once told me that what you leave out is more important than what you put in. And uh, I think um, certain companies have made that almost into a religion. But it's really, really hard, especially if you work in a big company. because. Every five minutes, you'll have a product manager for some feature, or a, a, you know, it's an engineer who's developed this technology or that, coming to your desk and saying, it's really important, it's critical, you've got to get it in, it's got to have a big colorful button and everything. And you just have to find some way to quiet the noise and say, okay, this is the most important thing, this is what will focus everything else, forget about it, put it away. What you should never also do, and something which happens to me all the time, is you get in a meeting and you're discussing something, I don't know, the, the um, it's the button that goes ping, whatever. And, um, uh, and, and there's an argument around the table and one person says, oh, it's really important that it's, that it's green or it's really important that it's, it, it like goes ping and someone else goes, oh, it's really important that it goes pong. And, uh, and they can't agree. And then a third person who just wants them to shut up and go home so they can you know, uh, get out of the meeting says, let's have a setting. We'll have a setting in the, in the preferences, and there'll be a switch that goes from ping to pong, and the user can decide. <laughs> That's a terrible idea. You should never, ever expect or force the responsibility of a decision onto the user. Make a decision. Like, have some courage. Um, make the decision. Don't have a setting. And if in doubt, kill the feature. Because if you can't make a decision, the user probably doesn't give a damn. So, the next one is um, tell stories. So stories are really, really, really useful things. They're fantastic tools um, because, well, for a few reasons. First reason is they give everything a really nice human context. When you tell a story, a story has a beginning and a middle and an end. It usually has characters and, and uh, protagonists and, and uh, an outcome. Um, and outcomes are especially important. So there's a sign of talking to. But that's kind of the idea, right? So, um, so, so uh, a story is way, way better than something like that. That, again, don't look at it too long because you might turn to salt or something. But uh, this is a requirements sheet, and this is how software gets built. So every time you've nearly torn your hair out over some crappy web bank that, that like, just you can't figure it out is because someone designed it with one of these, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, if you put stuff in a story, it makes a hell of a lot more sense. The other reason why stories are important is because interaction, and please forgive me, because some of you are probably like product designers, and I more have a, have a digital background, so I'm biased. But uh, stuff which is interactive, interaction is a narrative. It's a story, it's about movement. It's not about any one given state any one particular screen, it's about the movement between those screens. And that's what a story is, it's a narrative, it's a flow. So if you want to explain something, and more importantly, if you want to check something, that something makes sense, tell a story about it, make a flow. It drives me nuts when designers come to reviews and they put something in front of me and they go, they, they show a mock-up and they say, oh, this is the home screen, and this is, this is the payment screen, this is the fulfillment screen, because they, they're just, they're shown in isolation, these things. I'd far rather see flows. This is the first time experience. This is the payment flow. This is the error flow for you know, this thing, whatever. And you look through these flows and you can say, oh, that makes sense. Not too long. It's not completely broken. Everything adds value to the flow. So you see, there's not much detail, and that's mainly for a reason, but like, you see these little green dots. They're just little tools to say, okay, tap here, tap there. Just simple things, not rocket science, but it shows a story, it shows a narrative. And there are all kinds of tools, scenarios, and personas, and 
blah, 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 whatever. But the, the screen flow or the flow, like a story of how someone uses it in each step, is a super powerful tool. And it leads nicely into this thing, which is <coughs> the principle about make things and then break them. So prototypes, and people will tell you this all the time, which is good. But nothing that I'm going to tell you here is particularly original or particularly, uh, it's not rocket science. It's just kind of simple things that sometimes work. Um, so making things, prototyping stuff, and then breaking them is a really important part of designing and, and, and delivering really nice stuff. If you're not building and breaking something every day, there's something really wrong. Um, a really nice example is an old example, which is this thing. I mean, it looks bizarre. It looks like nothing, uh, nothing like what it turned out to be. But it's valuable because it, it, it helps help these guys figure out. Okay, this oh, it's a mouse, by the way. Just in case you've not seen this. Okay, this is pro this is um, uh, uh, damn it, I've forgotten his name. I'm getting old. Um, this is a prototype made by a guy in Xerox Park for the first map. So he's figuring out, okay, there's an object, and you move it around, and it's got some buttons on it, and the movement is then uh, uh, illustrated on the screen with a, with a cursor. Um, this is a, another nice one, right? It looks <laughs> kind of bizarre, but it serves a purpose. So the, the, there's a few things in here. There's a few points, I guess, that I'm trying to make. Uh, one is that... Um, uh, instead of talking about stuff, <coughs> instead of waving your arms around, instead of writing a document, instead of writing a spec, make a prototype. Prototype, don't spec. Specs are useless. No one needs them. No one cares. Make a prototype, everyone will get it immediately. Um, the second thing is, is that like there is a step-by-step a, a, a -step process by which you go from really fuzzy, really sketchy stuff, and you're basically drawing on the whiteboard or talking or discussing on post-it notes and whatever, and slowly you get a little bit more detail, a little bit more detail. So there's a time and a place for like different levels of, of beauty, different levels of polish and finish and fidelity. Um, and at the beginning, you should not rush to a computer. So like draw, draw with a pen and figure out like, okay, this is roughly what we're talking about. You can be all abstract and so on. And then you get to you know, this stage, which is the, the next stage in the thing, which is like wireframes and get a rough sense of scale and how many things you'll be able to fit in there. And, and uh, th by the way, Keynote is, a, is an awesome tool. If you design interfaces, you do a quick um, a wireframe in, in uh, whatever, Illustrator, you can even do the wireframe in, in Keynote. Just gray boxes, it doesn't matter. People know roughly what it is, Greeking or some dummy data. And then you put these pink things on uh, which are links to other slides. So you just make like this. This is a big click-through prototype. So you can then go into presentation mode and click your way through it, and it feels like kind of almost you're using the thing. So fast, quick prototypes, and then break them, and be humble to realize that they suck, and then build another one, and test it again, and then build another one, and test it again. So that leads nicely into the next one, which is fun, which is You've got to learn to love change. Um, so being able to handle change and actually enjoying it is, I think, one of the things which makes design as a profession and the people who practice it really well different and unique. A lot of people freak out about change. They don't like it at all. They don't like uncertainty. And that feeling at the beginning of a project where you think, wait, what, what, what am I supposed to be doing? And How's this going to work? And what, what's the problem that I'm solving again? All those things, they're very disconcerting. And if you remember back to that diagram that I showed you, there's a reason why it's shaped like that. It's because you're actually creating more options. It's divergent thinking. It's, it's, um, it's generative. And uh, then it's shaped like this because you whittle them down. And you come down to a converged point. You synthesize all your ideas down into one thing. But this. This process where you blow stuff out is really scary, and people freak out. And, and, and people who are not comfortable with the, the way designers think tend to hover around your desk and go, have you, have you got the mocks yet? Are you, what, do you know what it's going to look like? And is it ready yet? And um, That's generally a bit dangerous, because you might miss something. But change is really important. It's really important in a, in a 
in, a, in a project level, in an object level, because um, often what you'll find is you'll make something and it'll, you'll make a prototype and you'll test it and it'll teach you something. And you'll go, wow, okay, um, this is really not working, but there is one part of it that's kind of interesting. So let's, <coughs> let's change the brief. Let's challenge the, the brief that we were given, like the, like the, uh, the blind uh, uh, tea cup uh, thing. Um, let's just do something completely different. Um, and that takes quite a lot of courage. Uh, and then the, the other element of change is, is on, a, on, a sort of on an industry level. Um, change is, is actually the only way that you, you can survive as a business, as a company. If you don't change, you die. And there's a fantastic example of that um, not too far from here. So uh, being able to, to pivot, which is the trendy uh, hipster Bay Area word for change uh, is, a, is, a really, is a really important part of designing and building and making something really cool. So these guys, uh, I don't know how, how many of you know the story of how this started. I, I hope I'm not boring you, but um, so Flickr actually started out as uh, something called Game Never Ending, which was an online, massively multiplayer online game. Uh, and it was a bit crap really, but there was one feature of it which was really interesting, which is they had these live chat rooms which weren't about text chat, or I am, they were about sharing photos. So people in the game would put photos into these live sharing rooms. So they, 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 uh, during the kind of development phase of Game Never Ending, they realized that people hated the game but they loved these chat rooms. And they went, wow, oh, great, let's build a photo sharing service. And then they built Flickr, and they did very well. Then they got bought, and not so much. Uh, Twitter is another very good example uh, of what they did, which is a bit different, because they didn't pivot completely. They just released a really raw thing. It was very bizarre. And then they watched how people used it, and hashtags, and app, uh, like direct messages, and all these things, which they then featureized. They all came from people essentially hacking a very open and very raw system. These guys figured out that they had to change from being in this business to being in this business. And a couple of real, apart from the fact that like, the product's kind of nice, um, a couple of really strong indications. Uh, they dropped the word computer, it used to be called Apple Computer. And in January 2007, they dropped the computer because they don't make computers, they make things, they make objects that do stuff. Uh, and so that was a very important cultural shift for them. But, um, being able to change, being able to adapt to change is, is super, super important. And uh, in, in my recent career, that's been a real challenge. People don't enjoy change, so especially when they've gone down a road a long way, which by the way is I think the most important thing. Do all the changing at the beginning when it's cheap and, and keep a process and a culture where change is cheap. Because if you have a really heavy process, <coughs> a lot of baggage, change is really painful. You know, people get fired and it's scary and, and like, uh, you know, it costs millions and millions of dollars to pivot. Um, which leads nicely into this thing, which is about culture. So culture, what time is it? Um, culture is uh, an interesting word. Again, it's like design, it's a very broad sort of word and it gets used in different ways. But um, as a design student, uh, I got really interested by um, how the cultures that make things shape the things they make. When you look at an object, you can tell a lot, you can see a lot about the culture that made that object, that led to that object. So this is, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Shaker movement, but the Shakers were like a hardcore version of the Quakers. And the Quakers were a hardcore version of the Protestants. So these guys were pretty hardcore, and, and they had some core values, which was use as little energy as possible so that you have more energy left for praying. Um, and so they, they were really ingenious. They, they invented the dumb waiter, which is this mini lift that takes food up and down from the kitchen upstairs, so they didn't have to work so hard. Um, so they had more time for praying. Right. Um, but the other thing is they believe very strongly in simplicity and, and that ornamentation was a bit like, um, well, they were like the anti-Catholics, let's put it that way. But you look at their stuff, their objects, and they're very, very distinctive, both form and, fun and function. The same goes for national cultures. 
And uh, Finland, particularly, I mean, I, I came to, to, to Finland already knowing quite a, a lot of the objects and the, the heritage and the kind of legend, myth that is, is the Finnish design heritage. Um, and you can look at an object and you can say, yeah, that comes from the Nordic school. And, uh, and you recognize it. Uh, and it sets certain expectations. Actually, we'll come to that in a minute. So the same goes for companies. <coughs> and the same goes for the products those companies make. The best, the easiest example to give is, is obviously Apple, which has a very specific culture, and they make objects which reflect that culture. Nokia has a very different culture, makes objects that, that reflect that. But there are plenty of other examples of teams and cultures and the stuff that they make. So the point of me telling you all of this is if you want to make something with specific qualities or specific, in a specific way, you have to think about how to get your whole team to share in that vision how to, to, so that you form essentially a culture that will then make that thing. So the size of the team is really important. If it's too big, that will become hard. Um, so anything n new which is different and new is generally as a rule of thumb easier to make with a small group of people and the bigger the group of people the harder it gets so if you join a company and, and the vp of imagineering or whatever introduces you to the to the innovation and, and, uh, and design strategy unit and says he has 50 people, you should run away as fast as you can. Because it is not really, it's incredibly hard, let's put it that way, to, to create a, a, a specific culture with a large group of people. So small is generally good. You don't need a lot of people to make something, especially not with the tools that exist today. Um, the second thing which is really important is this shared vision, these shared values. People have to understand. and this links back to a lot of the things that I've already spoken about. So everyone needs to know what problem they're solving and understand it in the same way. Everyone needs to, even stories, really help to, to create a shared culture uh, that, that people understand, okay, this is what we're doing, this is how we're doing it. And there's a, there's a nice example, which is a cartoon that's been uh, circulating around, and it's nerd humor, so I apologize for that. But for those that can't read it, essentially these are different views on a, on a metaphor for a, a product. So the first one says how the customer explained it, which by the way is also a stern warning about listening to what people say rather than watching what they do. Never listen to what people say because Henry Ford would have made his faster horse and so on and so forth. The second one is how the project leader understood it. He obviously wasn't listening very well. The third one is how the analyst designed it and Analysts tend to want to do things as elaborately and as impressively as possible. Uh, this is how the programmer wrote it, uh, how the business consultant <laughs> described it. And this is how the, the project was documented. Um, this is what operations actually install, which is a snide underhand remark. And always, when new services launch, launch, they never have enough servers, particularly if they're good and people actually want to use them. Um, this is how the customer was built. Um, this is how it was supported, and that is what the customer actually needed. So having a way of, of um, getting everyone on the same page and saying, right, uh, this is what we're making, this is why we're making it, this is the problem we're going to solve, is, is super important. Um, I don't know where we've gotten to. This is probably nearly the last one, maybe not quite the last one, so bear with me. If anyone needs more alcohol, I'm sure it's okay to get some. Uh, so this is... Um, this is about kind of the recognition that nothing that you make ever exists in isolation. It's never this perfect, solitary object which just sort of floats in space and people come to look at. Then, then it would be art, and, and that's also um, that also exists within a within a wider context. So really, it, seeing the big picture, realizing the system into which your thing, the thing that that, that you're making. Will, uh, will fit is critical, and not realizing that usually makes it redundant. It certainly makes it very hard to use. So um, these guys weren't the first to, to make a smartphone, not by any means. They weren't the first to uh, ask developers, uh, outside developers, to make stuff that would run on their phone. 
but they were the first ones that actually made it possible for anyone without a computer science degree or a rocket scientist to, to put the things on the phone and use them. So they realized that this object doesn't exist in isolation, it's part of a system, and that system means you know, finding stuff, discovering stuff, paying for stuff, getting it on there, using it, rating it, sharing it, and so on. And they designed the whole thing for that. Another, oops, this could go badly wrong. That's what happens when you turn your phone off. Why don't I just do that? Another uh, example of this is a super nice company. Um, uh, has anyone heard of this? Has everyone heard of this? Okay, so there's a guy called Shay Agassi, um, who is an Israeli entrepreneur who, um, he's just, he's either mad or he's the most courageous person I, I can think of in, in business because he's essentially taken on the biggest, gnarliest problem in the biggest and gnarliest way possible because he realized that just making an electric car isn't enough. <laughs> Electric cars need a whole system that supports them. And if you wanted to change the way that people move around, if you wanted to change person, uh, personal mobility, it wasn't enough that he just made an electric car. He had to design the entire system. So there's a couple of things which are super interesting. One is just how ballsy it is. Um, he's designed everything from uh, the battery systems to the, the stations, the, the equivalent of gas stations, where you, you drive in, and instead of charging the thing, you're charging stupid, right? And he figured that out. It, it's, it's very limiting. Even, I mean, even <coughs> just your phone battery uh, maintained sometimes a bit like rocket science. Um, so what he figured out is you, you should just drive in, and a, a, a basically you, you park your car in a similar sort of uh, level of accuracy as when you go in a car wash, so it doesn't have to be perfect. And, a, and an arm just takes the battery out from underneath the car, puts another one in. Great. Um, he figured out that, okay, in certain places you do need to charge, and, and that's how that would work. And then there's software that manages the whole thing, uh, that helps you use less power, so you get places more efficiently and so on. He figured out that there has to be software which manages the whole network. And he figured out that, that there's no way that one company can build all this stuff themselves, so he has to have standards which allow a, a network of companies and partners to make stuff that works in the system. So it's a, it's a, a big kind of hairy problem. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this is, is uh, that he borrowed or he stole uh, a system design from another business and applied it to this, which was very smart. Basically what he did was he, he stole the pay-as-you-go mobile phone business <coughs> and applied it to electric cars. So everything is leased. You don't own the battery, you lease the battery, and you pay per mile, <coughs> like you pay per call. So it's very groovy, and it, it, um, it really uh, illustrates well the whole, uh, uh, the whole uh, notion of seeing things, seeing the bigger picture, seeing the whole system in which your one thing uh, exists. There's some other more, uh, you know, maybe more down-to-earth examples, like, uh, uh, the, the price of uh, recycling a beer bottle is built into the price of the beer and then you take the bottle back and you get your money out and, and so on. The same with fridges in Japan, they build the price of recycling the fridge into the fridge which then makes the shop that sold you the fridge responsible financially for recycling that when the fridge ends its life. So, um, you've got to see the big picture. Oh yeah, okay, I think this is the last one. So, um, Emotion is, uh, is often overlooked. And um, a lot of, what, basically what it means is a lot of stuff just turns out kind of dry and kind of boring. And people sort of make, make things without remembering that actually they're supposed to be fun. And if they want people to use their product, people have to love <coughs> the product. And love is a very strong word. Um, and it's sort of under. It's overused and under understood. It's not well understood. So um, <clears throat> I didn't get this for a while. It confused the hell out of me. But we built this this awesome piece of software that like used peer to peer technology to 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 send your voice around the world for free, basically. <laughs> but people um, didn't 
always want to use it because they preferred MSN Messenger's emoticons. That was the reason they give. Like, oh, why do you use MSN rather than Skype? And the reason they give is, oh, because I like the emoticons better. They're more funny. They're nicer. They make me laugh more. And, and, uh, and equally, like when we finally figured this out and did nice emoticons, people stay with Skype and they talk about Skype because of the emoticons, not because um, of other things, which is kind of amazing. But they're little things that make people smile and, and, and kind of uh, amuse them. These guys also uh, figured out that, that if you make someone enjoy using your product, they will use it for longer. And they will tell their friends about it. And then their friends will go and buy your product, which is Awesome. These are, by the way, the um, geniuses that I work with on a daily basis. <laughs> so, thanks a lot for sitting through it. These chairs don't look so comfy, but I remember, I still remember how uncomfortable they actually are. Um, I think uh, the last thing to say to, to kind of wrap stuff up is, is that um, I'm going to sound like a, like a a bitter old man, probably, but uh, I'm loving how much opportunity there is in Finland right now, and I'm really, really enjoying seeing the consequences of that and the amount of energy that's going on at the moment. There's a massive change in design in Finland, uh, which is in the middle of happening right now. When I was a student here, Basically, everyone went to work for Nokia. And if they didn't go and work in Nokia, they did what I did, which is they set up an agency of like two, three people, a tiny little agency, <coughs> and they worked for Nokia. There was this massive sucking behemoth that basically ruled the, ruled the industry. That's just not the case anymore. There's so many other things to do, and people now, you guys and the, the people behind Alpha and the people behind Garage 48 and the people behind the sound of startup and all these incredible initiatives have figured out that it's time to you know, get the energy going and the enthusiasm and the expertise to, to branch out, to go across to the, to the Bay Area and get funding, to, to take risks, to try stuff, to have fun. And that's, uh, that's an amazing thing. It's a huge change in this community, in this culture. And, and, uh, and I think it's, it's a fantastic thing. So I would urge you to try really hard and fail a few times and learn and uh, keep trying because it's, uh, it's there's some pretty awesome stuff to be done, some nice problems to be solved. So thanks a lot for listening and if you have questions or if I was confusing then please ask away. <laughs>